I'm going to talk about the mantle of a healthy, growing church. But in this teaching, I'm also going to show you how God has released a mantle in your life, in your family. God's mantle comes upon churches, individuals, family lineages, even nations and communities. And most people don't understand this. It is in the impartation of the mantle that we get empowered to fulfill destiny. Because every one of you here, you are not a mistake or a coincidence. The hand of God is upon your life. Some of you, you missed an opportunity to say amen. Should I do that again? Yeah. Every one of you who's here, the hand of God is upon your life. Life being life, many things happen to us, Bazalana. We go through challenges. We go through problems. We go through pain. We go through disappointment. Sometimes our plans get interrupted. We go through seasons that we don't understand. But let me tell you something. God's mantle can never be erased by anything. You may be delayed in getting there, Mara. Getting there, you will get there. Because when God puts a mantle or a grace on a people, the one thing we pray for is for those people to be aware of that grace because the painful thing is most people are not even aware of the mantle and the grace that's on their life because when a mantle is on your life, you operate so easy in those areas that you may be tempted to think that it's your natural ability. Things are so easy to do, so smooth, that you may think it's because of the way you are organized. It's up until that grace is removed. See, when Samson was killing the Philistines, because the power of God came upon him, it was so easy for him to do it. But in the process, he forgot. Because you see, when a mantle is on you, you've got to protect it. See, when David prays and says, God, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me, that's a, that's a big prayer. Because if God can remove his hand or his mantle from you, you can't go anywhere. So Samson, here he is now, because he didn't know how to protect the mantle, he lived wrong, he lived a rough life, he indulged himself in sin, and the problem is sometimes the mental can still work for a while, even when you are living in sin. So don't be surprised when you see somebody used of God still living in sin. Mara, it will not be forever. There comes a day where God says, like my grandmother used to say, Kechanoch. And when he removes his hand on your life, what used to be easy becomes difficult. And Samson, one day, after he had slept over at Delilah's house, busy sinning, when Delilah said, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are here, the enemy is here, when you read it in the Bible, it's such a sad story, such a sad passage. It says, and Samson rose up thinking that he will do what he usually used to do. And the King James says, and he wished not that the Spirit had left him. Because, see, when the, when the hand of God is removed from your life, it happens so silently that you, the person, is the last one to find out. Everybody else who's looking at you says there's something a short time. Mara, when are you busy saying, no, me right? And he didn't know, the Bible says. He didn't know. He didn't know. Because see, when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, when God anoints you, it's, such, it's so explosive, so powerful, so earth-shaking, it becomes an experience that you are so aware of. Like I, I was giving that example, you know, and I'm going to talk about it later, but Ricky Buena, on, on the day when I was 
prayed for to come into ministry. 1983, when Pastor Andrew Knutze laid his hands on me, just like a, a, a coat was put on me. It was distinct, it was clear, it was strong, it was powerful. I knew what happened. But you see, when the Holy Spirit lives, or when he gets depleted, and when he moves away from your life, it is not as spectacular. You are the last one to find out. So you don't want to become careless with a mantle, with a grace. Because remember, God didn't give you that mantle because you deserve it. It, he, it was predestined before you were born. When God talks to Jeremiah, he says, before, before you were conceived, before you were brought forth, before you were a fetus in your mother's womb, I knew you. So, you existed even before your mother became pregnant of you. You existed in the mind and the heart of God. You were not born to find a purpose. You were born to fulfill what God has predestined for you even before you were conceived. Before, 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 before you were conceived. I knew you. Not only did I know you, I set you apart. I gave you a mantle. I put a grace on you to be a prophet to the nations. So as long as you walk in the path of that grace, Jeremiah, it will be doable. It will be possible. I'm not saying your path will not be filled with challenge. There will be challenge, but challenge and all, you will be able to do it. To be a prophet. And the question I want to know sometimes from people is, do you really, do you really know what your mental is? We're going to answer that in this series. We're going to answer that in this series. Let's talk about this mental. As you can see at the back there. I'm going to use that word mental in a generic sense, but a mental in Bible days was the item of clothing that was the distinctive Hebrew outer garment, as you can see there. It was made of two pieces of thick woolen material sewn together with slits rather than sleeves for the arms. A mantle was a loose-fitting garment or a roomy garment. R-O-O-M-Y, lots of room. And usually it was brightly colored. Like we read about the many colored coat or the many colored garment or mantle of Joseph in Genesis 37 verse 3. And the many colors of his government, of his garment prophetically speak of the many different seasons in a person's life or a of the church because we all go through different seasons. But as we go through the different seasons, it is the grace that sustains us. The grace sustains us. We come out of it having lost something, but the grace of God sustains us because life gives us different seasons. And if you learn about the mantle and the grace on your life is the many colored coat that Joseph, even when his brothers took him and threw him in the pit and sold him into slavery and hated him and disliked him, even if his friend in jail wouldn't talk about him and help him out, even if Potiphar's wife tried to set him up and lie about him, but the many colored coat will bring you to your destiny. Because nobody, but nobody can stop what God wants to do in your life. Ah, you are not saying amen this morning. I thought you said. So a mantle was called a tunic, a cloak, or a coat. The typical Hebrew slept on the floor with his mantle used 
as a covering to keep him warm. This was especially true for travelers, for shepherds, and for poor people. And in times of anguish and pain, the Hebrew would tear their mantle to show their distress. Like you see in Job 2, 12, and in Ezra 9, 3. Like you hear God talk about the children of Israel in the book of Isaiah 58 about the fast. He says, when you fast, don't it just be a matter of tearing your mantle, your garments. But they would tear their mantle as a sign of distress. The prophets and the kings, even the priests, they also would wear a mantle. In their case, the mantle, in a spiritual sense, symbolized and represented their calling. It represented God's divine enabling in their lives to fulfill God's calling. As I said to you, in September of 1983, when I was prayed for by Pastor Andre Knutze, I remember standing there, him praying for me, 4th of September, 1983, and as he was praying for me, I had my eyes closed, and I literally felt like there was somebody putting a coat on me. And I, and I opened my eyes and looked around, and there was no physical person there, no physical coat there, but it, it was real as real could be. And then I remember in my heart, as Pastor Andres praying for me, I'm talking to God, and I said, God, God, what's going on? God says this is the anointing to become a pastor. Then I said, but God, you called me into the ministry in 1979. This is 1983, four years ago. And when you called me, you said you are calling me to become a pastor. That's why I went into ministry. He said, yeah, I did call you, but I had not equipped you yet. And then he said, there are many who go into ministry without this. And then I realized as I read, and we're going to read it later, the story of Elisha. When Elijah came and threw his mantle on him, Elisha didn't start on that day to operate in the prophetic office. That day was a day of a sign, a signal of a calling. Because the throwing of a mantle speaks of the transfer of authority and power and the calling into an office. But before you operate, there is a process. Which is what today's pastors don't want. Lots of people who want to go into the ministry, they don't like this process stuff. But Elisha started on that day to serve Elijah and to follow Elijah. Even if it was signal to him that he is next in line, he still served. And a day came when God would take Elijah away. Elijah several times had told him, don't follow me. Don't follow me. Don't follow me. He says, no, wherever you go, I'm coming. Because you are the one that God is using in my life. Most people don't understand, Barcelona, that mantles are transferred through somebody. God uses people, even if the mantle comes from God. God uses people. When Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, in the waters of baptism, in the Jordan River, John said, now I can't baptize you. You are bigger than me. You have a stronger mantle than me. You have a higher office than me. Jesus says, now nah, you've got to do it. You've got to do it so that righteousness should be fulfilled. You've got to do it. And while John said, all right, he understood spiritual things. He takes Jesus, immerses him in the waters of baptism. And the Bible says, when Jesus came up out of the waters, the heavens opened. There are certain divine heavenly protocols. If you don't fulfill them, the heavens will never open. And the heavens opened. And a, and a voice spoke from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit as a dove came and sat upon the head of Jesus. Jesus was being anointed 
for his calling. But that anointing and the release of that mantle came through a heavenly divine process. Yeah. Most people want a mantle, but they don't want to follow process. They don't want to listen to process. They want their way. Listen, a mantle comes on God's terms. Not on your terms. Tell your neighbor, they want to think I think I want a bishop of Walwen. I or or Moyonwell or Kulumanao. And so the king, the prophets, and the and the priests, this garment represented God's divine enabling because God will never call you into an office and never enable you to function in that office. Elisha understood the significance of Elijah throwing his mantle on him. The throwing of the mantle signifies you are being called. It's a transfer of authority. Go to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Are you learning anything out of this, Basaba? Am I asking you, are you learning something out of this? People in the foyer, are you learning something out of this here? Bless you. I love you all in the foyer there. There's a strong anointing in the foyer there than there is. Uh, bless you. And the people who are in the youth hall as well. God bless you. We can hear them, Mara. God bless you where you are. Verse 15. Pastor can I just have your attention, please? You know, I was, uh, I was actually talking to the Lord about this month. And uh, he spoke to me to teach a certain topic and along with this. And I said, God, Mara, hey, that, 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 that is meat. That is... Uh, that is a higher grade stuff. And God says, oh, the people are ready. Yeah. Are you ready, guys? Yeah. We're going to pull out all the stops and, and give you higher grade stuff. So have you brought your hearts? Have you brought your open hearts? Are you ready, Basala? Are you ready for this? It's not enough to hear about it. My, my prayer and my desire is it must operate in your life. It's going to operate in your life. Are you there in First Kings chapter 19? Can you tell me how you tell? I also tell you once. And I'm reading the NIV Bible. And the Lord said to Elijah, <coughs> excuse me, go back the way you came. And go to the desert of Damascus. At this time, it's almost towards the tail end of Elijah's ministry. And God is about to orchestrate a transition, a handing over, and a succession. In God's terms, succession plan has to be dictated by God. It cannot be that the people vote who must be in line. <clears throat> it can't be that it's subjected to the vote of people. It's something that must be spirit-led and spirit-inspired. Tell your neighbor, why was I amen? And so God says, when you get there, anoint Haziel. <coughs> Excuse me. King over Aram. So Haziel was to be a king. Kings had to be anointed. Because to function as a king, you need the anointing. You need the mantle. Are you there, Barcelona? Any position in life, any responsibility in life, you need a mantle. Then he says, verse 16, also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshai, king over Israel and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel, king over Aram. Can you just warm this up for me? It's a bit cold. Anoint Haziel. <clears throat> hey, my voice mustn't give me problems. I must lead the prayer tomorrow. <clears throat> anoint Haziel, king over Aram. Verse 16. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshai, king over Israel. And note now, the point I'm raising, 
anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Meholah, to succeed you as prophet. <coughs> so Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. Elijah found Elisha. You don't find a mental, a mental finds you. Are you understanding what I'm saying? You don't go out seeking to be a prophet and to be an evangelist and to be a whatever. You don't do that. You just busy yourself with the everyday mundane things as we talked about it in our series last month that the God supernatural door of opportunity is bumped into during the everyday mundane things of life. Where there's no bells and whistles, there's no tunda. Just an ordinary everyday thing. Why? Because the set up to the higher things of God is when God can observe and watch how you handle the everyday and the mundane things that have no glitz and have no glamour, have no glory. So Elijah finds Elijah. He didn't go out looking for him. He didn't try to wrestle the anointing and force the man of God. He's the man of God by God's demand and God's instruction who found him. And note where he, where he finds him. He says, he finds him plowing. He finds him plowing. Plowing, not preaching. Not in a Bible school. Plowing. This is a powerful principle for mentors. God doesn't find his prophets in a Bible school. Thank you. God finds his prophets in the everyday, mundane, regular, non-spiritual activities. Because God looks at how you handle the normal, mundane, non-spiritual as a sign of how you will handle the sacred and the anointed. That's why God calls people who are faithful in the normal, the mundane, the dirty, the forgotten. Because to be a farmer, it's a difficult job. You work out in the sun, you smell because of the sun, not because of you, because of the sun. You get sunburned. Sometimes you have to learn to work for a whole year only for the crop to be lost in one day. Either through bad weather or through locusts and pests. Or when you are just about to, to, to rip the fruit of your reward, then something bad comes about. So it demands patience, it demands commitment. Nobody comes to pat your back and say what a good farmer you are. And it's a lot of hard work. When you must ask farmers, it's a lot of hard work. In fact, what you get in return sometimes is much less than what you put in there. And God says, that is my Bible school. That is my training ground. I'm going to look at people, how they serve in the normal and the mundane. Because this is what I've seen with this current younger group, Yabaruti. They are too much of executives. They are too anointed, too important, too high class, too cheese boy, and cheese girl, if there's a cheese girl. That because they are pastors, they cannot even sweep the floor. They can't do something mundane. They can't fix anything. They can't paint a place. They can't build. They can't get dirty. But they want God to entrust them with the anointing that changes people's lives. And God says, never. That's why they are so fickle, some of these young ones. They are so break bar. Any small thing takes their ministry away, takes them out. And they don't have what it takes, the resilience of a farmer. 
the commitment of a farmer. When God wanted to look for somebody to deliver his nation from Egypt, he went to the backside of a desert to an 80-year-old man who was a shepherd. A man who, in his own right, there was no need for him to be working for someone else because he knew what it is to sit in the highest seat in Pharaoh's court. He knew what it is to be treated as a prince, to have people serve him left, right, and center. But him being served didn't change the attitude of his heart. He was a servant at heart and a hard worker at heart. And God is looking for men and women like that. And God says, I'm going to go for that old man. He may be old, but he has what I need. He may be old, but he is the right vessel to carry my grace and my anointing. Can I hear an amen in the house? And God goes to Moses and calls Moses. One day God sends the prophet to go to Jehu's house. To go and look for a one who's going to be a king over Israel. And the prophet also, he looks for a guy who has the looks. Tall, husky, handsome, dark, muscles rippling, six pack. I'm not saying if you're like that, God can use you. Look at your neighbor and say, no, God will still use you. <laughs> and the prophet is misled because he looks at all the others. Even the father is so misled that after the prophet had gone through all the children, the father didn't say, I have one who's out there who's smelling like sheep. He rises up early, he comes back late, smelling all the time, just like the sheep. Out in the sun, but he didn't know that out in the sun, out in the wilderness, he learns his biggest lessons. He learns how to use his faith to come against a lion and a bear. Right in the wilderness, he learns how to compose psalms for God and to worship God. He doesn't realize that God doesn't build his people in a Bible school. God builds people in the hard knocks of life. Now you may not like my message, Marang Zoshumayel, it's all right. I'm trying to teach you something about the mental. I'm trying to show you there's a mental on your life and you've got to be a certain type of container to be able to carry that mental. The weight of that mental, if it comes on a container that is too sensitive, a container that is too feeble, the, 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 that, that container can't handle it. Paul says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We, we are carrying the anointing. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, God is talking to you today. And so David gets anointed because the mantle finds you. But God checks how you handle the normal. Jesus says, if you're not faithful with unrighteous money, he says, who can entrust to you true riches? God just looks at how you handle your money. And it determines how much he can entrust true riches to you. Yeah? Yeah. See, that's why when people battle about the moment, you, you ask them a simple question. Which church are you serving at? Are you in the ministry of help? So, no, 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 no. God has spoken to me. No, I'm a Hanyan. Let not God speaks to me. Where did you serve? How did you start a church? How were you released into ministry? Now, oh, God works in mysterious ways. Yours is too mysterious for me. <laughs> because when we read the Bible, there is a process. <clears throat> when Jesus was looking for the disciples, he goes for the smelling fishermen. He doesn't go for the Pharisees and Sadducees who were scholars, Bible scholars. Not that there's anything wrong in being a Bible scholar. Just become a Bible scholar and a fisher and a shepherd and a farmer, all in one. And Jesus chooses those. And what does he do? These are people from a small town of Galilee. But I'm going to do about that. It's my ditch of water. You don't know the job water, eh? How's it with the job water? You go northwest, the job water. 
What's that going to do about a small town? Nobody knows about it. Negligible place. But listen to me. With God, it's not a matter of where you come from. It's the matter of how much capacity you have to carry. It doesn't matter what family you come from. It doesn't matter what background you come from. It doesn't matter what people say about you. It doesn't matter if you grew up a poor person. It doesn't matter if you come from an informal settlement. It's not a question of where you come from. It's a question of how much of the glory can you carry? How much of the glory can you carry? And God trains you in the school of hard knocks. God trains you in the farm, looking after sheep, fishing. And God looks at that and said, they are doing a job that they are not thanked for. They are not proud enough to work that work. I can trust them. Know what it says, Bazan? It's amazing, this verse. It says, so Elijah went from there and found Elisha. Found him plowing. He himself was driving the 12th pair. Watch this. And Elijah went up to him and threw, and threw, and threw his cloak around him. The Hebrew word there means, refers to an action that is initiated by the one who has the garment. There was no act on Elisha's side to try and, and get it from Elijah. But it was Elijah who threw it to him. That's how you get the anointing. You don't wrestle it. You don't force it. You become the right candidate and God puts it on you when he wants at his time. But when you get it, please look after it. Don't lose it. And because he understood what had been done to him, verse 21, it says, Elisha left him and went back. And he took his yoke of oxen, slaughtered them. He bent the plowing equipment to, the cook, to cook the meat, gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he went out and followed Elijah and became his attendant. What is he doing? He's saying once the mantle hits you, your life changes forever. <laughs> once the mantle hits you, it, 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 it orders your priorities. Once the mantle hits you, everything about you has to be about it. Once the mantle hits you, you can't say no. The only answer is to say yes. Because if you say no, not only do you get in trouble, you cause everybody around your life to be in trouble. If you don't believe me, ask Jonah. God sends Jonah to Nineveh. God sends him there. God delivers a message there. And instead of going there, he decides to get on a ship and go to Tarshish. He's deciding, I'm not going to follow what God has told me. I'm going to do my own thing. And then all of a sudden, the people who, who are with him on the ship, when they noted that the ship was having serious weather problems, they said, no, Konumunto Lana, who doesn't belong here? Thank God they were spiritual people. So the Bible says they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they come to Jonah, and they say, Umfuwe tu aiga abine. Skoko aiga abine. Mara, you have to disembark. <laughs> Yeah, but we're in the middle of the ocean, Barmuna. If you don't get off, we're going to die, all of us. We don't want to see a song. I got this So they take him and say, overboard. <laughs> but God in his grace had prepared <laughs> a whale to swallow Jonah and deliver him to the right address. God in his grace will show mercy on your life. God will be gracious to you. Because God wants you to operate in the mental. God wants you to operate in the mental. Sometimes we miss it. Sometimes we make wrong decisions. 
Sometimes we go around with the wrong crowd. We get influenced. We, we allow voices to speak to us. We allow people to influence us. And we forget that the mark of God is on our lives. Because when God puts his mark on your life, you can't erase it. When God puts his mark upon your life, you will only be at peace. When you follow what God says you must do. When God called me as an 18-year-old young man, I knew my life was changing forever. I didn't know what I know today, but I knew enough to say even if I wanted to go and be a school teacher, and finally be a lecturer at university, but God's calling me, I'm going straight to Bible school. And that's what I did the following year, 1980. I knew I will never be a businessman. I knew I will never be a celebrity. I knew I will never be popular. I knew that none of those things were my desire. Mine is to just pastor a church. I didn't have an idea what kind of church. I didn't know what the path would be like. But I said, here am I, Lord. Because I tell you, you will never be at peace. You'll never be at peace. You can try everything. You can pursue your own thing. You can try to drown it out. You can try to detour as much as possible. But when everybody else is sleeping, you'll be lying awake. You will carry this thing in you that eats away at you. Because when the mental finds you, particularly the mental for ministry, when it finds you, the only way is to say, yes, Lord. You may not go immediately, but you have to go finally. And Elisha decides everything else that ties me to my past, I'm getting rid of it. I want to have one direction. Opportunity is here. Time and tide has collided. Opportunity is here. I'm going to reorganize my focus, my priority, my vision, and where my life goes. And he follows Elisha. Ish, nah, come on, nah, come on. So a mental therefore, Bazalana, write this down, is a combination of God's gifting, God's ability, God's divine enablement, God's favor, and the anointing to fulfill purpose. Let me say that again. A mental is a combination of God's gifting, God's ability, God's divine enablement, God's favor, and the anointing to fulfill purpose. And a mental comes upon individuals, churches, communities. Listen to this. By the grace of God, when the mantle falls upon your life, in the natural, it's a big, roomy garment, loose fitting. But in the spiritual, it means you will have room in your life. Room to move. Room to grow. Room to succeed in your calling. Room to make mistakes and they don't destroy you. Room to learn. Room to move forward. It means when the mental falls on you, all the things that seek to restrict you cannot hold you back. Why? Because the grace of God is on you and you have room to move. You have enough grace to fulfill your God-given vision and to go further in your lives. And this is why we need to also understand that even on families, this mental falls. Every family has a unique mental. Or let me put it in the words of Acts chapter 4. It says about the early church, and great grace, Great grace came upon them all. Let, 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 let me decode it for you. Everybody who was at the church in Jerusalem, Ben 
benefited from the grace that God had poured on that local church. And this is why I tell people, don't treat the matter of a local church lightly. When you find one that your heart connects to, get planted in that church. Why? Because the grace that rests on that church oh, will by default come up on you. So the grace was not only on the church, it says, and great grace was upon them all. I'll talk about that more next week. But let me explain it to you. I look at some of the young ministers that by the grace of God are mentoring and they have come to me to say, we recognize you as a father to us, we want you to father us, we ask you to lead us and help us in ministry, they are not in Grace Bible Church. They are not running Grace Bible Church churches. They have their own churches. Most of them, when I met them, they hadn't even started pastoring a church yet. But they said, by virtue of what we see in your life, we want to connect to you. And when I prayed, I did feel like they are the ones because we don't connect with everybody. And I can tell you, Barcelona, over 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, some of them, I'm amazed at how in their ministries, our story is their story. I remember in particular, I can talk about many of them. Let me talk about two for now. Three. Pastor Glenn Makam. When he first came to our church, I remember I counseled him one year he came for counseling. I didn't know who he was. He came, drove all the way from Emma Lachlan to come and see me. And so I talked to him. I, I, I can't remember what he said. He was so, so confused. And he tells me, I've forgotten. He tells me that he stayed away from me for two years. Went into all kinds of wrong things. He says, Mara, for two years I kept sending him text messages. I don't remember that. Finally, he finally came back to his senses. And came back to see me. Cut a long story short, he was going into the ministry. And Mama is here. We've walked that journey together. And by now, as we speak, he has a lovely, thriving church out. They have bought their own building. Debt free. And here it is, Wazalan. Their church, like ours, is a growing church. It's a thriving church. Murutum Tsuen. When the church was handed over to him, I remember when we went... The person who was running the church was a businessman. He's handing over the church to this young man. Fifteen people in a classroom. When I looked, I said, I know this. <laughs> I know this. This is the field. This is plowing. Cut a long story short. Murjum Swen now. Church has grown. They've bought a site. Kokatlo Hong. They've built a building there. He's planted several churches already. I was talking to Mrutim Sipa several, several weeks ago. Yeah, now when he first invited me, he was inviting me for a prayer in January. And I didn't want to go because I don't just go. You know, I wanted to know who's your spiritual father. And he says, no, it's uh, the late Mfundisim Zimel. I said, Mfundisim Zimel, I know Apostle Zimel. I'll come for the sake of your father. Amen. And when I went there, they were meeting in a beer hall. <laughs> Please don't judge me now. <laughs> I didn't say the beers were there. They were not there. It was just the hall. Small building. How many people were there? A few people. 50, 20 people, 30 people. 20, 20, 20, 20 people. Imagine me driving all the way to Delmas for 20 people. Yeah. Now, as I speak, he's bought a huge building, massive building. One of the most Beautiful building, successful. He's built church. He's planted several churches. He's pastored several churches. He even planted one cocaine at end. The brother is moving. <laughs> now let me tell you why I told you that. That same grace. Are you, are you understand what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, you are going to get more anointing than anybody, my brother, because you understand what I'm talking about. I'm saying that same grace is your portion. It might not 
not be necessarily that you run a church if you don't run a church but listen is the grace to grow if you have your business i prophesy let your business grow don't be afraid to grow even if you are starting small we started as 35 people in a classroom here we are today we are announcing 32 churches somebody shout hallelujah The grace to raise leadership. The grace to be vibrant in the spirit. I look at the morning prayer. And I'm telling you, Barcelona, it's a grace that God has given us as a church to lead prayer. I want to challenge some of you who are not joining in the morning prayer. You are missing out on the grace in the morning. If I was you, I would save money and buy data to join in the morning prayer. Because once you join in there, great grace was upon them all. Yeah. That's why I tell people, when you connect to the place where God has put you, things begin to change in your life. You're never the same. The grace to buy things and pay for them cash. Let me prophesy to you. Let me prophesy. Let me prophesy. When we started, we were in a classroom. We started at maybe Saul, but when we moved, when we were chased away, that's what I should say. We ended up with 35 people in a classroom. Let me tell you the grace so that you can hear what I'm saying. Oh, Jesus. Oh, God, I'm going to speak about this. You, do you mind? Can I talk about it? Do you want to hear about it? Do you want to hear? Because I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about you. Can I, can I hear? I'm trying to show you. I'm trying to define it for you. I'm trying to show you where to look. After we were expelled from the school, I get a letter on a, on a, on a, on a Thursday at Rema. The letter was sent to Rema, not to me. Even if I was the pastor, it was sent to Rema. And in this letter, I was told, this coming Sunday is your last Sunday at that building, maybe so. So I was at Rema. I don't remember what I was doing. I was buying books or something. As I leave, Pastor, pastor Ray's younger brother, Ellen McCauley, chases me down and says, here's a letter. They brought it to us, but it's meant for you. I didn't have a car. So I take the letter, I run to the bus stop, get into the bus. As I'm in the bus, I open the letter, and I read the letter, and my heart sinks. Because here it is, it's a Thursday. I'm told that the coming Sunday is our last Sunday, which means if we get an alternative place, I've got to get it the following day on Friday. How can this happen? And as I'm sitting there, are you listening to me, Bazalana? Can I tell you this story? Can I tell you this story? And forgive me if I get emotional about it. As I'm sitting there thinking, God, what am I going to do? Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. It doesn't matter how people try to upset you and set you up and conspire against you. If God has called you, God will sustain you. You mustn't worry. In my confusion, I wasn't even praying, Barcelona. I was confused. I was hurt. My heart sank as I'm sitting there. God brings the name of my former principal, Principal Noche, who has passed on. And he says, go to no Principal Noche tomorrow and ask to use the school for the church. I said, I haven't seen that man in years. He says, go. Following day, I wake up early in the morning, half past eight, I'm at the school. Principal Anoche, because I used to be a student at Isaac St. Primary School, and I'm pizza so no, yes, so no, mun. Kara principal, I'm not working, second, I'm not working. Oh, well, I'm not working. I'm not working. I'm not working. Now, principal, you know, uh, you know, the venue and the reuser for Kere Kero now, but I'm not working. This is the last Sunday. So I'm actually looking before Kifeta. He goes, oh, Munna Sonaman, you should have come last month. Yeah. Listen, you haven't heard the story. He says, you should have come last month because committee has decided that we mustn't have churches anymore. If you were here last month, we would have considered your application. But he's talking now. Here I'm standing. And from nowhere, I see the Holy Ghost take hold of my principal. And then he stops. He says, uh, Ahmara, no, it's okay. And I'm watching that. I'm watching that. 
And then he says, he says, no, he says, no, Mara, Mara, there, there, there's a church a Yuzang building here. Yeah. Ba, 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 12 o'clock. Yeah. Same hall. So I can say, you know, without thinking, I said, I, I, that's how nine o'clock started. That's how this time, yeah. Because our church come maybe so in a Kalaka 10 o'clock. In a Kalaka 10 o'clock or maybe so. For just, I, I didn't even think. I just hate myself. You know, when Jesus says, in that day, don't worry what you, oh, you're not hearing what I'm saying. Oh! I just hear myself saying, nine o'clock. He says, in that case, so no more now it's all right. Mara, make sure. I said, we'll make sure. First Sunday. First Sunday, Baba. The 18th of September, 1983, was our first service at Isaacson Higher Primary School. We had no music group. We didn't have much. We sang a cappella. We had no instrument. Didn't you see right? And as I looked in the crowd, I was the only person who had a semblance of what a church looks like. Everybody was a lay person. And I remember standing there, fear in my heart. Here we are singing, and I'm about to preach. And from nowhere, oh, the Holy Ghost fell. People start jumping out of their seats, dancing in the spirit, sitting in the Holy Ghost. There's just total Holy Ghost pandemonium in there. I'm looking at this. I'm as surprised as everybody could be. Because when God has called you. I remember a young lady who was brought there. She's passed on now. She used to be one of our ushers. I won't call her name. She had a, a Down syndrome. She had been brought, carried into the service, her spittle running, everything, and she was drooping in a very bad condition right in that service. Without anybody praying for her, without anybody laying hands on her. This is why I protect the hour of worship with everything in me because I know that mental. I know what worship means to our church. I know what God's done during the worship service. I can tell you story after story after story. I know the grace. And this young girl who was carried into the service, at the end of the service, as I was standing inside the building, I see her walking in her own, not drooping. She became one of our main leaders in ushering. She's passed on now. Only 35 people in the building that day. And from 35 people in that classroom, that grace. Some of you, you don't see the grace God's put on your families. Because when you look at every family, I'm going to cover this next week. Families carry grace. And it's only wise for the people in that family to understand the grace in their family. So that as you pursue your careers, I ask you if possible, don't move into a career that's outside of your grace. There's families how they share. People in the medical field, it's business people, it's musicians. Families are like that. Not everybody becomes a musician or a bit, but the distinctive characteristic, and somehow they succeed in that field. It's a grace. I said, it's a grace. I see the grace of God on your life. I said, I see the grace of God on your life. So at times when God raises somebody, he raises somebody to rescue a lineage out of course. A family line that has been derailed. Because in that family line, there came somebody in that family line who didn't become faithful in following what God had said. 
They pursued other things and took the whole family in a wrong direction and they planted wrong seeds and evil seeds and finally the whole family line goes off course and you find this family that has no direction. They don't know where they're going. Things are not working. But God in his grace, like he did in the life of Josiah who had a grandfather who was not following God and a father who was not an example. He came from multi-generational people who were going in the wrong direction. But listen to me, that seed of the mental will always be in somebody's heart. What God is doing, he is reaching towards that seed. He is reaching towards that mantle and he's trying to raise it up. And most people have never understood why is it that your battle, your journey rather, is so difficult. All you are doing is to try and do the right things. But the devil is throwing everything at you and you don't understand why is my journey so difficult. Let me speak to you as God's prophet today. Your journey is difficult because you are the one that God has chosen to bring the whole family back on track. And now you are fighting the demons that defeated your grandfather. You are fighting the demons that defeated your great-grandfather. You are fighting the demons that defeated your father, your mother, your family line. Because those demons were able to bring them down. But let me declare in the name of Jesus, it will never bring you down in Jesus' name. This is why I've learned... To serve God even when it's painful. To serve God even when it's difficult. To do the right thing even when you don't understand and when you're not seeing the fruit. Because I'll tell you why. The destiny of the entire lineage rests on your shoulders. You may wonder why must they always come to me? Why must I be the one to try and help? Why am I the only responsible one? Why am I the only one who gets bothered? Why am I the only one? Stop asking those questions, Kwanakohai. Stop asking those questions. God has pointed his finger on your life to carry the mantle of your family line. And when you understand what's at stake, you make a resolution. Make a resolution. No matter how hard, no matter how difficult, I'll cry, but I'll go on. I will limp along, but I'll get there. I'll have times of being discouraged, Mara. I will put my, pull myself up and I'll get there. Because if you can do it right, God presses the reset button and God recalibrates the destiny of your family lineage and he brings them back to line. Oh, am I talking to people in this house? Am I talking to, do, can, you, can you feel God speaking to you? Can you say God is talking to me today? This is the same thing God does in churches. When churches have gone the wrong way and God raises a minister. A minister who starts doing things differently, who they may be misunderstood, they may be talked about, but they carry a mantle. Your life has to be beyond you. You have to live for others, not just for you. And that's why we live for others. Will you all stand? I want to pray for you. I feel the anointing of God in this house. Will you pray in the Holy Ghost for a while? Please, I ask you, everybody. Don't pray the light prayers. Don't, don't pray the lightweight prayers. Pray the intense, fervent prayer. Pray the heartfelt prayer, the way God has spoken to you. Some of you, your heart has broken in a thousand pieces this morning. And you feel a burden. You feel like crying. Let it out in the name of Jesus. Pray before God. Talk to God. God who's changing destinies. God who's reorganizing destinies. 
He's reorganizing destinies this morning.